Hi, church family. God bless you. I hope you're having a great week. I'm excited to spend this time with you. I'm excited to share with you. We'll be in uh, Matthew chapter 16. But before that, I do want to share some announcements with the uh, scripture reading plan moving forward for this week. We'll be in Matthew 23 through 28 and Psalm 115 through 117. We just invite you to continue to read. We're just going to read, read through the scriptures together and walk with Jesus daily. And then every Wednesday at 7, you can connect with us on uh, YouTube or Facebook. And most of the time, I'll be teaching from the previous week's reading. Uh, there will be times that we'll have a prayer emphasis, and there will be times that Kurt leads us in a, in a time of worship. Uh, but we want to be able to minister to you every Wednesday, so we'd love to have you join us. Um, two great fellowship um, events coming up really soon. We're in the fall, which is one of the best times of year for us to do fellowship. So this Sunday, the 26th of September, is our chili cook-off, our annual chili cook-off. We're also going to have hot dogs, a couple of little fires out on the property, and uh, just a great time to, to come and hang out and be together. We'd love to have you join us 5 p.m. this Sunday. And uh, the following Sunday, October the 3rd, we're going to have another combined outdoor service at 1045. Just an opportunity to get everyone together, both services together. What we'll do is at 9.30 a.m., we're going to have a lot of donuts, and we're going to have coffee and hot chocolate and, uh, and hot cider. So just a fun fall fellowship time. And then at 1045, we'll have a combined worship service with everyone together outside. We, we have the seating, but if you could bring a chair, that would help us. And then we also just want to let the church know that um, we can do baptism um, outside. And so if there's anyone in the church that would like to be baptized or is interested in learning more about baptism, please talk to Pastor Drew or me. We would love to, uh, to help you take that important spiritual step in your journey. So those are the announcements. We are in Matthew 16. The, the title of the lesson is The Call to Self-Denial. And so we're really going to look at uh, some interactions with Jesus and the disciples, specifically with Jesus and Simon Peter. And we just see so many interesting things play out in Jesus' relationship with Peter and the dynamics there. And I think that we can identify with those, that, uh, that Jesus is leading us, that, that we are daily to surrender our lives and, uh, and seek his will. But it's a process. And uh, there's a lot of grace along the way, a lot of missteps. And we see that in the life of Peter. One minute he does something that's filled with faith, and then the next minute he turns around and just seems to fall flat on his face spiritually. And, and I think that we can identify with that. And we see that here in this passage. We see him at one of his uh, moments of greatest faith, only to then see him um, you know, completely contrary to the will of God. And, and in the midst of all of that, we hear the call that we deny ourselves and follow Jesus, but we also see this beautiful experience of grace and healing, um, not only here, but if we, as we continue in the Gospels, we, we just see that dynamic between Jesus and Peter. I think it's beautiful. So I'm going to read to you beginning in verse 13. Uh, when Jesus came to the region of Caesarea, Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is? They replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others, Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. But what about you, he asked, who do you say I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Jesus replied, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Then he ordered his disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah. So again, here we see one of the great moments in the, in the life of Peter. Jesus asked the disciples, basically, who are people saying that I am? And, and some said, Elijah. Um, and Jeremiah and some of the other prophets, some said John the Baptist. Then Jesus gets more direct, who do you say that I am? And, and Peter gives a great response. We'll, we'll get to that in a moment. But, but that's part of what we see with Peter is um, he seems to be the first one to speak out. And sometimes that's, you know, he says something great. And then sometimes he says something um, less than great, uh, puts his foot in his mouth. 
And, and again, just the dynamics and not only here, but, but, but to, to read through the gospels and, and, and see all of the, the grace and the tenderness and the mercy, the patience of Jesus with Peter, that, that he saw something special in Peter and he spoke vision into Peter's life. But at the same time, uh, then, then Peter would put his foot in his mouth and, and be kind of fall on his face spiritually. And we see the grace and the tenderness of Jesus. I just think it's all fascinating. But when we think about Peter, why was he always the first one to speak out seemingly? And uh, he may have uh, just kind of naturally been the leader of the 12 disciples. Uh, I think there's a really good chance he was more extroverted than most of the disciples. And, and maybe he just had the strongest personality. When I read through, especially the, when he messes up, um, when I read through, a lot of times it makes me smile. I, I feel identified with him. I'm not like crazy extroverted. And I'm not a really strong personality, but I'd say I'm somewhat extroverted and uh, I have somewhat of a strong personality. And so I, I really do feel connected to him. And, uh, you know, especially when um, he puts his foot in his mouth. And so I've shared this illustration before. It's one of my favorites. Um, may, maybe you've heard it. Maybe you haven't. But here's an example of, of when I put my foot in my mouth. I was probably 17 years old and I was with uh, my youth group in Ironton. So, so it was a big deal when we were in Ironton to come up to Columbus. And we came up to Columbus to go to the water park by the zoo, which is now Zumbezi Bay, but this was so long ago, it used to be called Wyandotte Lake. And I was there with my buddies and we were standing in line for one of the, the big water rides. And um, this really attractive girl uh, walked past us with her boyfriend and he had this long rock star hair, just a good looking dude with this long, rock star hair and i just made an innocent comment to my buddies why is it that the guys with the long hair always seem to get the pretty girls i, I thought it was a fairly you know i don't know an innocent comment um it, i didn't think it was that big of a deal but they didn't really answer me or respond to me and so i kind of realized that something wasn't right and, and of course i looked over my shoulder and who's standing by, behind me in line at, at, at this ride at Wyandotte Lakes, it's, it's two dudes with long hair, pretty long hair. And these dudes looked way rougher than the guy who walked across there with the girl. So these, these guys also had rock star hair, uh, but they weren't nearly as handsome as the, they were rough. They, they looked like they could, and they were angry. Like they heard what I said, <laughs> they were angry. So I turned around and, uh, and knowing that I've just put my foot in my mouth big time. And so one of them says to me, do you have a problem with guys with long hair? And so I backed out of that as quickly as I could, but I'm like, oh no, I don't have a problem with it. I just think it, you know, I just don't understand why they get all the pretty girls. I just probably sounded like a complete idiot, but I'm trying to keep, uh, I'm trying to say whatever I need to say to prevent these guys from doing violence on me. And, and you know, the, the good news is they, they didn't do any violence on me. But the point is, that's just one example. I could share more. That may be one of the most dramatic examples. But I know what it's like to put my foot in my mouth. And, uh, and we see that with Peter, and we're going to see that in a moment. But here, uh, ba back to this passage, um, and, and I, I'm saying all of that because I do identify with, with the Apostle Peter. But back to the passage, um, Jesus says, who do you say that I am? And of course, Peter's the first one to speak up. And he says, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. And then Jesus affirms Peter. These are verses I've already read, but I'm going to read them again. He says, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah. This was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter. And on this rock, I will build my church. The gates of Hades will not overcome it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. So Jesus says, this was revealed to you by my Father in heaven. In other words, Peter, you are right, and it is God who has revealed this to you. God is speaking to you, and he has revealed this to you. So that's a big deal. And then he goes on, he says, I, he, he, he says that Peter is the rock. He's the foundation upon which Jesus is going to build the church and he, and he lets us know that, that nothing can stand against, not even the gates of Hades will be able to stand against the church. So, so what an honor, what a calling 
that, that he is he's speaking vision into Peter's life, that I'm going to use you. You, you are the leader. You're, you're going to be the, the, the primary leader of, of the movement. He, I, I don't know that the word church had even been used yet, but, but he, he was going to be the leader of the church. He says, whatever you bind or loose on earth will be bound or loosed in heaven. And so he's talking about that, that Peter's going to have spiritual authority. And we see all of this in Acts chapter 2 when the Holy Spirit comes upon Peter. And, and now he's inspired and filled by the Holy Spirit. And, and all of this comes true, that, that Peter does become the primary leader of the early church. And God uses him powerfully. And so here's an example of Peter speaking out and being used by God, and he has faith. And, uh, and, and I bet Peter felt, you know, affirmed in that moment. And, and then in the very next verses, he totally falls on his face spiritually and puts his foot in his mouth and says the wrong thing. Now, I don't know if these experiences happened like one after the other. I don't know how much time there was in between, but they're literally the very next verse. So I actually love that part of the passage, that in, in, in just these few verses, we kind of see Peter at his best, and now we're about to see Peter at his worst. And, uh, and, and you know, just identifying with that, that there are times that, that we feel so strong and, and we're in such a good place and, and filled with faith. And, and then sometimes it does seem like the very next day um, that, that there's a struggle or a battle or, or we fall on our face in some way, feeling like we have failed God. And so in, in the failures and successes of Peter, I think we can identify. But let's continue on with the scripture. So now we're, we're looking at verse 21. From that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of the elders, the chief priests and the teachers of the law. And then he must be killed, and on the third day be raised to life. Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Never, Lord, he said. This shall never happen to you. Jesus turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. So Jesus is now sharing with his disciples the plan of God. And he shared this with them several times. But uh, it's, it's interesting. It seems like they were confused by it. They, they didn't seem to get it. Uh, sometimes they, they just rejected it. Like, that's what Peter does here. Um, but, but they just couldn't seem to, to get a handle on it. The basic plan is this, that Jesus was letting his disciples know, I'm going to suffer, um, the, the, and, and the religious leaders are going to kill me, and then God will raise me. And, and again, the, the disciples would either misunderstand it or not believe it or hear it. They're just rejecting it. And, uh, and then again, we see an example of the strength of Peter's personality, that he actually took Jesus aside and it says he rebuked him, took him aside, began to rebuke him. Never, Lord, this shall never happen to you. In other words, Peter said he, it, it's, it's not going to happen. He's implying I'm not going to let it happen. It's not supposed to happen. And, you know, it's interesting to try to get a hold of Peter's motives here because he's speaking strongly. He's rebuking Jesus. But um, I think there could be several things at play. One is he loved Jesus. He didn't want Jesus to suffer. And so to see Peter at his best, we see him as somebody who loved Jesus and wanted to protect Jesus. Another possibility is um, it was really hard for anyone in that day and age to envision the Messiah dying a shameful death on a cross. Um, that, that was the, the death of, of, of the, only the very worst criminals. And so for, for the disciples and, and pretty much everyone else, their, their understanding of the Messiah in that day was that the Messiah would come and establish a political kingdom and overthrow Rome, that they would no longer be dominated by the Roman government. And so it's, it's possible that that was part of the struggle, that Peter just could not wrap his mind around it, that Jesus would suffer and die. And so he, he may have been rejecting it because of his understanding of who the Messiah was. And then if we consider Peter's motives as maybe not being so pure, um, it's clear that the disciples were excited that they were chosen by Jesus. Nobody else would have asked them to, be, to, to follow them, but Jesus did. And so now they, they view him as the Messiah and they're expecting a political kingdom. And it's possible that Peter was excited about the opportunity that he had to be in authority or leadership. 
And, and that did not fit at all with Jesus suffering or dying. So, so it's, it's really hard to know what his motives were, but he rebuked Jesus. And then Jesus, who just a few verses earlier affirmed Peter, and he said that God has revealed this to you, and, and you are Peter on this rock. I'm going to build my church. The gates of Hades will not stand against it. Whatever you loose, um, he's talking about the spiritual power, that whatever he looses on earth will be loosed in heaven. And, and now Jesus says to him, get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. And so when we first read this too, it also seems like a very harsh thing for, for Jesus to say to Peter. Like maybe we would think, come on, Jesus, it, it's an honest mistake. Uh, but keep in mind, Jesus did know what was happening in the motives of Peter. And, and so obviously he's, he's aware of all of that and, and he's able to confront as he sees fit. Um, but he's also condemning Peter's words at, that they are inspired by Satan. So a little earlier, a few verses earlier, his words were inspired by God, had been revealed to him by God. Now Jesus is saying that his words are inspired by Satan, that, that he is being used by Satan, that he's an interest, instrument of Satan, so much so that he refers to him as Satan. Um, we, we, we consider today that he says uh, that, that you are a stumbling block to me. And, and I want us to consider for a moment that, that if there was ever a time that Jesus struggled to be obedient to the will of God, struggled with temptation to go his own way, it, it was likely referring to the path of, of, of suffering, the path of the cross. And, and we see that in the Garden of Gethsemane, that Jesus is, um, has such intense despair and uh, he's crying out to God three times he says let this cup pass for me he's, he's talking about the cross let but but not my will your will be done he he ultimately surrendered to the will of God but we see that he was experiencing tremendous despair and, and he's asking God to let this cup pass from him so in other words when he says get behind me Satan maybe he wasn't speaking to Peter maybe he was speaking to Satan because in that moment, Satan was using Peter in an attempt to tempt Jesus that, that, that you're not going to suffer. I'm not going to let this happen. So I think he was speaking to Peter, but I also think maybe he was speaking directly to Satan. Because if there was any area that, that Jesus felt, you know, a temptation, um, a, a desire not to obey the plan of God and the will of God, it, it may have been the cross. And um, we do understand that, that Jesus was tempted. It says in Hebrews, tempted in every way that we are, yet he was without sin. But, but he, he knew the temptation and the struggle. We know that, that Satan tempted him um, in, in, you know, earlier in, in, I believe, chapter 4 of Matthew. We see the temptation. So temptation was a real experience in the life of Jesus. And here, um, Peter's words may be a temptation to Jesus. Satan is using him. And so he was... He, he affirmed Peter in such a beautiful way a few verses ago, and now he says to him, get behind me, Satan, you are a stumbling block to me. It's interesting to, to again, just see this, this strong admonition that follows behind one of, one of the great affirmations that anyone received from Jesus. And then a few verses later, such a, a strong admonition, a strong rebuke. Then we look at verse 24. That is a significant verse for us as we seek to understand the call of God. Jesus says in verse 24, then Jesus said to his disciples, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. He was making it clear to the disciples, if you want to continue to follow me, if you want to be my disciple, then this is the calling. You need to deny yourselves and I believe he's also speaking to Peter. He's speaking to all of them, but he's speaking to Peter. It's not your plan. It's not your will. Um, you have to deny. You have to set aside your plans and your agendas. We're going to go the way of God. And the way of God is that we deny ourselves and we take up our cross, which is a call to suffering. And, uh, and we know that many Christians throughout history have not only has there been a, a lot of persecution throughout history and, and certainly in our day, 
There are Christians all over the world being persecuted in significant ways. Good Christian people sitting in jail cells, good Christian people having to have secret underground church. And, and there have been martyrs throughout all of history, and there continue to be Christian martyrs. Jesus said to his disciples, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves, take up their cross, and follow me. It's an important verse for us. I believe it's important that, that, that there are lots of verses that remind us of, of all of the beautiful benefits of relationship with God. And, and I think it's important that we have this verse and, and verses like it that call us to such a high level of sacrifice but we also are aware of the verses that remind us of all of the blessings of our relationship with God and, and that both of those inform us. So I remind you today that, that when we talk about the Christian life, there's a lot to celebrate. Forgiveness of sins is such an amazing experience. The peace that we are able to experience in our relationship with Jesus, the joy that we have, certainly the gift of eternal life, the purpose that we find in a life of serving Jesus the contentment um, that we have, that, that I remind you today that life with Jesus is qualitatively better than life without Jesus. But at the very same time, we cannot ignore the high calling of the Christian faith, that Jesus doesn't want just a part of us. He really does call us to a full surrender of our lives, to a full surrender in service to him, that we would surrender our lives to God that we would be reminded it's not our will, it's God's will. That the same way that Jesus had to remind Peter, Peter's saying, this is not going to happen. Well, um, yes, it was going to happen. And if Peter was going to be a disciple and continue to follow Jesus, he needed to set aside his plans and his agendas and the things that he wanted and surrender to the will of God. And so, brothers and sisters, we are also called to this life of self-denial, that we daily surrender our lives to God and we daily say to God, what is it that you have in store to me? Lord, I am here. I am willing. I am available. And I want to serve you. And Lord, if you would lead me and guide me, then I want to follow and be obedient to your will for my life. A life of self-denial, a life of even picking up our cross and, and following Jesus. Many throughout history have understood this call in a very real way, even to take up their cross when we consider the persecution and the martyrs. So friends, we're going to pray in just a moment, but um, I just want to share maybe three quick thoughts in closing that we consider as we study through this passage. The first is God uses broken vessels. So I want you to be encouraged today. Look at how God used the apostle Peter. Even though Peter said the wrong things, did the wrong things, put his foot in his mouth, that, that he needed a lot of grace, a lot of forgiveness, that, that healing had to come, that the restoration had to happen. Uh, we think about after his denials of Jesus, how, how Jesus tenderly restored him. Um, I think all of that's beautiful. We're reminded today, we don't have to be perfect to serve the Lord. He uses broken vessels. Thank the Lord that, uh, that he wants to use you and me. And when we do struggle and fall, that he will pick us up and, and there's grace and healing. And, and he's just doing this beautiful work of sanctification in our life, making us more and more and more like Jesus. Um, but he uses broken vessels. Um, we, we can serve him right where we are. That's the first thought. The second one is when we think about the journey with Peter, the relationship with Peter, we do just see the, the, the grace of God, the mercy of God, his healing and restoration happen throughout the whole journey. And we're reminded of that today, that we are on a journey with God. And there are times that we are filled with faith and, and there are times that maybe we fall flat on our face and we're reminded today that, that Jesus loves us, there is grace, there is forgiveness, and he wants to, to bring healing into our life and restoration and uh, that whole process, that whole journey, the patience of Jesus, his patience. It's, it's beautiful. We see the tender, patient, loving care of Jesus in our lives um, as we are becoming what he's calling us to be. Um, his grace is, a be is beautiful. It is amazing. We think of the song, Amazing Grace. His grace is amazing. The last thing that I just want to remind us of, again, is this call to surrender, that um, a major piece, a major way that we should understand the Christian life 
is that we surrender our lives, our plans, our agendas, the things that we want, the plans that we have, that we daily surrender our lives and say, Lord, wherever you send me, I will go. Whatever you call me to do, I will do. I want to serve you, Lord. I want to do the will of God. Not my will be done, Lord. Your will be done. Let's, uh, let's deny ourselves and let's take up our crosses, even if, if there is great suffering ahead. And let's just make a commitment that we will follow Jesus and we will seek and, and fulfill the will of God in our lives. It's good to spend this time with you, church family. Let me have a prayer with you. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, uh, we thank you for this passage and, and we thank you for, Lord, your love, your patience, your um, restoration and healing in the life of Peter. We're aware of all that he will become later on after this passage. And, uh, and we see your grace and mercy and we're so grateful for it today. Um, just truly grateful, Lord, that you would use a broken vessel. Lord, I pray that you would encourage us. Lord, I believe that you want to use us. Maybe there are some who are very discouraged and feel that they can't be used, that, um, that, that somehow they're, they're too broken uh, to be used by you, that, that you would remind them today, Lord, that, that, that your grace is available for them, your mercy, that you would continue to do a work of healing and restoration. And Lord, today we do, Lord, I just I, I want us all to make this proclamation together. Lord, we do surrender our lives to you. Not our wills be done, but your will be done. Lord, that we would surrender our lives, our agendas, the plans that we have, and we would say to you, Lord, what is it that you are calling me to do? I want to live for you. I want to serve you. Here is my life, Lord. I surrender my life to you. I want to follow Jesus. I want to do the will of God. Lord, I pray a blessing upon the church family. I pray that you would encourage and, uh, and strengthen us. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. God bless you, church family. I hope you have a great week. I hope that we'll see you Sunday in worship, or you can certainly worship with us online. I, I hope that you'll come to the chili cook-off and, uh, and also join us in a few weeks for the combined outdoor service. Um, have a great week. We will see you soon.